Health Benefits of Polyphenols, How Polyphenols Improve Your Health and Protect Against the Negative Effects of Aging. There are a number of different nutrients contained within our diet that help promote health. Now you're probably familiar with the essential nutrients, which are vitamins, minerals, uh, and macronutrients that we need in order to survive. In other words, if we don't consume these foods, we'll become sick with a disease of deficiency, such as rickets, um, scurvy, pernicious anemia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, there are another category of nutrients found within our diet that we don't necessarily need on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, we'll for the most part, get along without consuming them. However, there is evidence that adding them to your diet is actually a net benefit. There are benefits we just simply don't understand, such as anti-cancer benefits, um, normal glycemic benefits, such as you know, helping you maintain a, a healthy blood sugar, uh, helping uh, regulate your appetite, your mood, your gut bacteria, and things of that nature. Polyphenols fit into this latter category of nutrients. But what are polyphenols? We're going to jump in and discuss what polyphenols are. We'll move along. We'll talk about the different types of polyphenols. Then we'll move along to the health benefits of polyphenols, both what do we think is happening, what are they doing, how are they doing it, and what does the data show about consuming polyphenols. And then finally, we'll discuss where you can find polyphenols in your diet. What are polyphenols? Polyphenols are protective plant chemicals. In other words, the plant uses these chemicals in order to protect them from UV damage or from pests uh, and, and to help them kind of survive, to bolster their survival. They have antioxidant and antimicrobial effects to the plants. However, they also have antioxidant and antimicrobial effects towards us. However, they are poorly bioavailable, meaning that we, well, we can consume them and break you know, the foods that contain them down into absorbable nutrients, we simply don't absorb polyphenols very well from the gut. And when we're looking at how can we determine if a food has polyphenols in it or not, the best way is the color. Polyphenols give plants their rich colors. That's one of the ways that they protect against UV damage. And by rich colors, we don't necessarily mean by pretty vibrant colors because um, you're talking not only about greens, the reds, and the blues, but also the greens, the browns, and the kind of tans as well. There are some really cool, unique aspects of polyphenols. As just mentioned, they're poorly bioavailable to us. We do absorb some of them, but we do not absorb very much of them, which means that what doesn't get into the circulation either goes to the liver and gets processed or stays in the gut where it becomes bioavailable to the microbes in our colon, having a beneficial effect on our microbiome. As we mentioned in the previous slide as well, that these polyphenols are actually plant defense chemicals that they use to kind of keep pests away and things of that nature. However, in us, they tend to have a hormetic effect, at least the, um, the plants that we consume that contain polyphenols. In other words, when we consume them, it's our body notices it, sees it as foreign and says, hey, we got to get rid of this. And the response is actually far, far more powerful than what that single nutrient causes. So while saying, hey, this is kind of a toxin, we got to get rid of it, it actually doesn't really have a toxic effect and it bolsters those um, detoxification pathways so much that it actually helps us detoxify other things in our diet that may not be good for us. And finally, polyphenols are transformed by our microbiome when they get into the colon and those microbes transform them into something that is more bioavailable to us so that then we can absorb them. Some of the beneficial effects on polyphenols are dependent on having the microbes that can transform those polyphenols into something that we can use. There are five primary types of polyphenols. This includes phenolic acids, coumarins, flavonoids, still beans, and lignans. Now it's important to point out that there are six other categories, subcategories of flavonoids. And because of this, we 
generally kind of separate rather than going across the five different types we separate them uh, into flavonoids and non flavonoids now the structure of the polyphenol dictates its effect so these different categories are dictating different structures which are going to have different effects in the body um, so that's important to point out you don't necessarily need to know the exact effects of each of these things just kind of know that you want to get a kind of a diverse amount of them uh, through a various range you want to get some flavonoids and non flavonoids and you want to kind of hit all of the different types of flavonoids as well however since we kind of know the classifications and we know the structures we can kind of figure out what these things are going to do uh, based on that so theoretically speaking if we're looking for a very specific effect we can look at the different polyphenols and get targeted effects by consuming more of each category we're not going to jump into that in here that's kind of more of a uh, how do you target specific problems uh, we're, what we're talking about here is how are polyphenols healthy and why should you consume a lot of them now that we understand kind of what polyphenols are and how there are different categories what does that mean about how po polyphenols improve our health how what mechanisms do they use in order to make us healthy well, first off, they reduce oxidative stress. They have antioxidant and anti-cancer effects. Um, so oxidative stress, you may be aware, plays an important role in our overall health, regulating inflammation. Um, it definitely plays a major role in regulating our microbiome. So these antioxidants can help quash oxidative stress by donating electrons to um, to free radicals uh, and then you know preventing them from causing the damage that they do again as mentioned they produce hormetic effects which we're going to discuss in a little bit of detail uh, in a moment uh, these have beneficial effects overall on us and help us process uh, different things help us kind of uh, prevent other potentially toxic chemicals from entering the body and bolster our cellular defenses they also lower inflammation they decrease intestinal permeability as well, and they improve the microbiome, which in turn makes them more bioavailable to us by making them uh, kind of a slightly changed metabolite that we can then absorb and then has beneficial effects within our body and in the gut specifically as well. As mentioned, polyphenols have a generally beneficial effect on the microbiome. We're looking here at this slide. They have, uh, which is kind of termed something called the dupli duplibiotic effect, meaning they have two effects. Um, they have an antimicrobial effect on pathogens, and they have a prebiotic effect on healthy bacteria. This term is kind of odd. I mean, just, just take this overall to understand that generally speaking, polyphenols are going to have a net beneficial effect on your microbiome. The antibacterial effects, basically, they disrupt a number of processes um, within bacteria and within biofilms um, such that uh, th these kind of pathogens don't really have a good chance at survival. And the beneficial microbes that they create a prebiotic effect for, they make them stronger. So they give a competitive advantage to beneficial microbes in our body, in our uh, colon. And this in turn causes these beneficial microbes to make beneficial metabolites that benefit, benefit our body, have our immune system kind of triggered towards these bacteria that would be bad and helps us fight them off. In other words, you know, kind of the bacteria are, are pulling the puppet strings within our gut, taking these polyphenols and using them to benefit benefit to bolster their survival over the bad guys which at the same time just happens to beneficially shape the intestinal environment which makes us healthy happy and have good digestion and absorption here we're going to kind of dig in a little deeper into uh, that hormetic effect that the polyphenols have so when we look at the gut this is just kind of a very basic illustration here we have the intestinal barrier this is the single layer of cells which is meant to help keep the bad guys out um, and regulate it in a way so that the good guys are here in the lumen uh, but preventing both from going from the lumen into our bloodstream now you've probably heard of leaky gut leaky gut is something similar here we have things slipping in between the cells into our blood causing inflammation causing inflammation in our gut as well um, so 
what happens when we consume polyphenols? Um, these polyphenols get to the colon. What that does is it causes um, it causes the microbes to make different metabolites. In addition, even the, the kind of unaltered um, uh, polyphenols do a very similar thing. It's not that they can't be absorbed into the cells. They do get absorbed into the cells. And what happens is the cells notice this, these kind of uh, polyphenols or their metabolites bind to the receptors in the cells, which identify xenobiotics or foreign chemicals. And so the cell says, hey, this is not supposed to be here. We need to get rid of this. We need to send this polyphenol slash xenobiotic in, back into the lumen. So what happens is this upregulates a protective program which detoxifies it. So if this polyphenol got in here, it alters it in a way so that the cell can spit it back into the lumen rather than having a lot of it get into the bloodstream. And it, in order to make sure that this happens, the cell also upregulates regulates other programs, programs that decrease inflammation and decrease intestinal permeability so that when you kick this polyphenol out in here, it doesn't just slip through a crack. So that's kind of the hormetic effect that these polyphenols and their metabolites do. Enters the cells, cells see it as a xenobiotic. Hey, let's get rid of this transforms it, spits it back into the lumen and tightens up the tight junctions and kind of has an inhibitory effect on inflammation to prevent those uh, tight junctions from opening up and allowing it back in. So this is just how this whole thing works. Um, so and we're going to kind of specifically talk about this dietary tryptophan thing. The AHR is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. This is one of the xenobiotic receptors. There's others such as the pregnant Pregnane X or steroid and xenobiotic receptor. Uh, there are a bunch of these receptors that are floating in our cells making sure things that don't get in don't get in. However, what's interesting is tryptophan is an amino acid which is typically packaged with polyphenols. Again, um, these are coming in fruits uh, and vegetables which are less bioavailable. So you get this package of a polyphenol and a, a tryptophan, uh, some tryptophan. This makes these tryptophan metabolites which trigger AHR activity. But there are a number of different metabolites which do this as well. It's just uh, the tryptophan derived ones are very well known and we're going to use them for an example we're going to discuss in a moment. Now let's take a look at the effects of polyphenols on conditions in the gut. Ultimately, what's going to attract healthy gut bacteria are conditions that are conducive to the growth of healthy gut bacteria. Conversely, conditions that are conducive to the growth of pathogens are going to promote the growth of pathogens. So it's critically important to have healthy gut conditions going on in the colon and throughout the gastrointestinal tract. So polyphenols ha have a very beneficial uh, effect on these conditions within the colon that help promote the growth of beneficial microbes. First, they increase the production of short-chain fatty acids. Some of them act as uh, effectively precursors that microbes you know, ferment into short-chain fatty acids, but additionally they promote the growth of bacteria that can also ferment fiber into short-chain fatty acids. As the name suggests, short-chain fatty acids are acidic, so that will lower the pH in the colon. Additionally, short-chain fatty acids, in particular butyrate, get oxidized by the cells of the colonic barrier. So what happens is when these cells take in short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate, they also have to pull in oxygen, which decreases the amount of oxygen in the colon, making it a more anaerobic environment, which is beneficial for the microbes we want. The microbes we want are mostly anaerobic. The ones that we do not want are primarily aerobic. So um, this overall effect of increasing the production of short-chain fatty acids in addition to fueling the cells in the colon uh, and kind of altering uh, their gene expression, it also lowers the pH and decreases the oxygen, making the colon more conducive to the growth of beneficial microbes. Next, there's evidence that polyphenols decrease the production or bind to harmful byproducts of microbial metabolism in the gut. In particular, uh, they have been shown to bind to hydrogen sulfide, 
altering hydrogen sulfide. Why this is important, uh, you can see in the image here to your right. Hydrogen sulfide is something that uh, we actually produce in healthy quantities within our cells, but our microbiome also produces when it has access to sulfur-based uh, amino acids and other sources of sulfur. It just so happens that sulfur-based amino acids, uh, specifically methionine and cysteine, are the primary precursors to hydrogen sulfide production. So we have this excess sulfur in the colon. We already have hydrogen production from other forms of fermentation going on. So we have these bacteria called sulfate-reducing bacteria that contribute to the production of sulfate to be um, reduced into sulfide, which can combine with hydrogen to make hydrogen sulfide. In low levels, perfectly fine, don't need to worry about it. But when we get enhanced production of hydrogen sulfide, um, which we would expect to see in a high protein diet, maybe not necessarily in everyone, but certainly in people who already have these uh, bacteria present within their colon. Uh, this produces too much hydrogen sulfide, and this causes hydrogen sulfide to kind of degrade our mucus layer. And what happens when that happens is that now the bacteria that's within our gut can get closer to the intestinal barrier and are more likely to cause inflammation. It, it, and leaky gut as well, decreases bacterial diversity. And additionally, it's important to point out that yes, we do want healthy microbes within our colon. The problem is we don't want them getting too close to uh, the intestinal barrier because they can also invoke inflammation as well. So when you look here, enhanced production of hydrogen sulfide will create you know, a, a weaker mucus layer, decrease um, the mucosal integrity, which means it's going to increase a leaky gut, and decrease microbial diversity overall. This is something we do not want, and this is something we see in both inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancer, is this enhanced production of hydrogen sulfide. Again, the endogenous hydrogen sulfide, that is the hydrogen sulfide we produce, is perfectly normal on our cells make um, uh, as a way to kind of help regulate how well our cells are working. That's great, but when we have too much, uh, this can be problematic, and this is primarily going to come from microbes within our colon. Additionally, it's been shown that uh, consuming polyphenols also decreases ammonia and a metabolite known as p cresol both factors known to negatively impact the gastrointestinal environment. Ammonia, for example, will actually raise the pH, which is uh, no bueno if we want to kind of cultivate a microbiome that is healthy. Um, and all of these, um, all of these metabolic byproducts um, are problematic. They don't just have negative effects on the gut. They have negative systemic effects as well. They can negatively impact the liver. So it's important to make sure we're not producing too many of these. Generally speaking, if we eat a lot of protein, we're going to produce more of these. However, if we eat a lot of protein and a lot of polyphenols, we basically hedge against many of the negative effects of uh, increasing animal uh, product consumption. So this is going to have a major impact on the microbiome. This is why we want to consume polyphenols. We want to make sure that we are getting a device, diverse diet. Uh, animal products are certainly an important part of that. They provide us uh, with a readily accessible source of amino acids to build muscle and to synthesize enzymes and all that stuff. But it's important to point out that you don't just want to kind of eat meat altogether without making sure that you're also consuming high polyphenol foods to make sure that you're not getting the negative effects of consuming these things. This brings us to some of the really cool data that we have on this. Uh, this maple trial is looking at a polyphenol-rich dietary pattern and how it affects things like intestinal permeability, zonulin, um, inflammation in older subjects. So it's a, it's a set of data with um, 60 subjects at, a, um, at an elderly care facility, so it's a fairly well-controlled trial. Their meals are planned. So what they did in this is uh, they basically replaced three of their low polyphenol uh, meals or foods rather, and they swapped them out with a polyphenol rich food. So they used things like chocolate, green tea, berries, pomegranate juice, and they added these to the diets of these elderly people. Uh, they swapped out foods that didn't really have polyphenols in them. And what they found in, um, in this is that a, there was decreased intestinal permeability in the people consuming the polyphenol-rich dietary pattern, which makes sense given what we just discussed. But it also decreased inflammation as well, and we're not just we're talking about systemic inflammation, inflammation in the body, not inflammation in the gut. However, chances are that the reason that 
inflammation decreased throughout the body is because it decreased everywhere. Um, the, the gut is a pretty rich source of, of uh, inflammatory mediators that cause systemic inflammation. But how did it do this? Well, it, had to, it did this because these polyphenols increased a tryptophan metabolite called indole-3-propionic acid, or IPA. This IPA, as well as other uh, tryptophan uh, metabolites, will enter the cell. They will trigger this aryl hydrocarbon receptor and cause these beneficial effects, prevent against leaky gut help inhibit inflammation. So overall, a beneficial effect. And again, bringing back to um, what we've talked about before, um, the thing about these polyphenols is they're not bioavailable. So think about kind of like a seed, for example. Seeds aren't very bioavailable to us, so they make them intact into our colon. And so you have this package of nutrients, package of fiber, tryptophan, which is relatively high in uh, pl high protein plant foods, and these polyphenols. And what happens is by consuming more of them, you get more of these metabolites because you're cultivating the microbes that would make these metabolites. So you have them in your gut and you get this hormetic effect where consuming the polyphenols actually increases these tryptophan metabolites in a way that protects against leaky gut and stops inflammation. There are a number of different foods that are high in polyphenols. We're going to start with the ones you probably don't think of because, as we mentioned, polyphenols give plants their bright, vibrant colors. And many people don't think of brown or tan as a bright, vibrant color. Uh, but herbs and spices uh, on a pound-for-pound -pound basis are probably uh, the biggest polyphenol powerhouses. The problem is herbs and spices, we don't really use a lot of them. So even though, you know, if you had a pound of herbs, they'd have way more polyphenols than anything else, you use a sprinkle of herbs and spices uh, when you cook. So... You're not getting a ton of polyphenols, but some of these may be more bioavailable or, you know, specifically uh, will target that colonic microbiome. So adding herbs and spices in your diet is a good thing. Cocoa powder and chocolate, um, you know, again, these are these are brown, so people don't think of them as bright, vibrant colors, but they are a um, they are a polyphenol powerhouse. In fact, in that study on elderly people consuming a polyphenol-rich diet, chocolate was one of the foods that they believe led to the improvements in intestinal permeability. Like you nuts and seeds so you're talking about nuts peanuts um, cashews uh, beans uh, seeds as well um, the reason being is these polyphenols are meant to protect the seed um, and nuts seeds and legumes also have a lot of other nutrients in them they're kind of packaged together they generally have fiber so they're gonna make it to your colon these these are kind of like these um, you know time release capsules that we have for polyphenols they're not only releasing the polyphenols when they get into the gut but they're also releasing things like tryptophan and fiber so that we get an overall net benefit. All berries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, citrus fruits, grapes, raisins, every fruit and every vegetable is going to have polyphenols if it's a brightly colored or colored at all. Coffee and tea, again, people don't think about that as, you know, kind of necessarily a food thing um, and the fact that they're not super vibrantly colored, but coffee and tea are a great source of polyphenols. Juices, uh, which I don't necessarily recommend people consume, uh, but they are concentrated uh, with polyphenols that are more bioavailable to us. They're already kind of liberated, and they did use juice in that older, uh, that elderly person study we mentioned before. They used pomegranate juice, and they used a uh, kind of a berry puree and an apple puree from time to time. Don't necessarily recommend juices. Um, but, you know, they are, it'd be wrong to not point out that they are really high in polyphenols because you're basically pulling the polyphenols out and tossing everything else. And as I just mentioned, all fruits and vegetables are going to have uh, a high amount of polyphenols in them. They're plant defense chemicals and they're plants. So um, you're going to see high polyphenol content in all of these foods. And finally, what are some decent strategies to incorporate to get a higher polyphenol content in your diet? First, eat the rainbow. Get the blues from blueberries and eggplant. Get the reds from raspberries, apple peel, tomatoes. Um, the yellows from yellow squash and yellow peppers. The greens uh, from grapes um, and lettuce and things of that nature. Make sure uh, browns, you know. Get your coffee, eat your chocolate, uh, nuts and seeds with their tan. Um, it's, it's really important to just get a diverse set of these things to have an overall healthy diet. You can then uh, later on just kind of tweak and find what works best for you and what you like. 
You also want to eat them throughout the day. You don't just want to do, you know, a few polyphenols in the morning. You want to eat them throughout the day. So maybe you have blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries for breakfast. Um, you have a salad, uh, salad for lunch, and then you have some sort of uh, veggies with your um, veggies and with your dinner, and potentially even a little snack with some more fruit. Eat them throughout the day. Don't just stick kind of you know, quarantine them to a single meal, vary them at each meal. Don't get the same ones all day long. Don't just eat blueberries the whole day. Don't just eat apples. Don't just eat oranges, things of that nature. Be methodical. Um, this is something we're going to kind of cover a little later on in a different video. Certain polyphenols have specific benefits um, for your choices, things that you kind of do on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you have a, for example, a, a family history of cancer, uh, the proanthos cyanins and cyanins, which are generally giving the purples and the blues, um, those are generally good for cancer. Um, another interesting study actually just came out where they found that um, actually soy isoflavones, um, they protect against the vascular damage that comes with um, smoking marijuana products. So if you're somebody who does that recreationally or for medicinal purposes, you can increase the soy in your diet and that can actually hedge against some of the negative effects of performing that habit on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll discuss that in a future video um, about the different types and what they do for us. Finally, tinker and swap. Try a bunch of things. See how they work. Things that don't kind of serve you, toss them out. Things that you do like, keep them. And over the long term, you will develop an excellent diet, high in polyphenols and high in the other foods that we recommend, such as fiber and animal proteins, to live an overall healthy and happy life. Thank you very much for listening into this video. If you have any questions, comments, or constructive criticism, put them in the comment section below. If you like this video and you want, want more and you want to make sure you get the polyphenol, uh, the, the kind of the different polyphenol categories uh, video that we have coming up soon, Please make sure you subscribe at the subscribe button. Make sure you ring that bell so that you get um, you're notified when we publish our videos. We did switch uh, to pub from publishing our videos on Monday to Sunday just to kind of get people were asking for that. So we did that. And finally, if you like this and feel that it would benefit some of your friends, please make sure to like it on the YouTube channel and share it on social media, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, however you like. So thank you very much for listening in and take care.